Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. It doesn't matter who you are, at times we feel very much alone in this world. And what I mean by that is we feel as though God is distant from us. Now, we know his word. If we are in his will, if we are part of his covenant people, if we are serving him, God is with us. In fact, the scripture says for a believer that he will never leave you nor forsake you. We can claim that promise that God, that he is a very present help in times of trouble. But nevertheless, there are times of trouble and we don't experience God. We don't seem to be receiving answers from our prayers. And we find ourselves, at least in our inner feelings, to be let aside, alone, abandoned. None of that's true, but we feel this way. So in those times in our life, what should we do? Well, one thing we should do is turn to the Word of God and not base our feelings upon what's going on around us. In fact, don't give much attention to feelings. No, cling to the truth of God, and in doing so, the truth of God will change your perspective and will impact how you feel. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Psalms, and Psalm 10. The book of Psalms and Psalm 10. One of the things that, that we see in this Psalm is that there is no inscription, no message to the chief choir director, no instruments given for the accompaniment of this Psalm being sung or chanted in the congregation. No, in many ways, this Psalm, Psalm 10, is a very personal and private psalm. One that one reads alone. In those difficult, maybe even dark times when someone feels abandoned and God's help, his promises, his presence simply is not being experienced. Psalm 10, when we read all of it, we will find comfort, and we will find insight that will give us a right perspective in those times of difficulty. Look with me to, to verse 1. Here again, we know nothing about the author of this psalm, but notice how he begins. He begins with the word why, and that is such a common expression, why, in difficult times. We say, why, O oh Lord, am I in this situation? Why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve this? And we have all of these questions that usually we'll never get an answer to. We need to hold on to the truth of God and not say, why is this happening to me? But how should I behave? What should be my mindset? How should I worship and approach the living God? And this is going to be one of the outcomes that we learn from Psalm 10, verse 1. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand at a distance? Now, this is how this author feels, that God is at a great distance from him. He feels, as I shared, alone, abandoned. So he says, why, O oh Lord, do you stand at a distance 
And the implication is that, that he's alone, that he's by himself, and that God has left him. But we need to remember truth. Don't be governed by how you feel. Be governed, be under the authority of the truth of God. God has said, I will not leave you. I will not abandon you. We are in a covenantal relationship with God, a new covenant and an eternal covenant. God is the keeper of that covenant. It's not up to us. We can have assurance. So even though we may feel that the Lord is, is standing at a great distance from us, that is not true. Secondly, this one feels as though God has become invisible, that he was there with him and that he has disappeared. He says, and we take that first word, why, and we continue with it in the second part of, of verse 1, and why have you disappeared when? at these times of trouble. Now, normally when things are going well, we just assume that God's with us. I mean, if we're experiencing blessing and deliverance, things are, are going very well in our life, we say certainly God is with us, and he is. But when things are going difficult, we say, where's God? Well, God has not departed. God has not become invisible. God has not ignored us. That's what this word is always uh, referring to, a God who is ignoring, a God who is disappearing, a God who is vanished. That's not our God. This individual, because of his affliction and troubles, because of the enemy, all these things have brought about poor theology in his mind that God has departed, that God has disappeared, that he is not there. False. God is with us. If you have experienced redemption through the blood of Messiah Yeshua, then you can be assured the outcome of redemption is intimacy with God. I shared with you many times that the, the redemptive name of Messiah according to the Jewish scholars, is Emmanuel, God with us. So God is with us. Just because we may not experience that in our, our, our senses, how we see, what we hear, what we feel, those things don't, don't determine truth. How I feel does not dictate reality. We know an individual one in for his uh, annual checkup. Doctor says, how are you feeling? He says, I am feeling great. Doctor was pleased by that. They did some tests and they found out that he was very sick. And soon thereafter, he began to deteriorate with cancer and die. So even though at that time he was not feeling the effects of cancer, his body was Ridded with cancer. So feelings do not always reveal fact. Truth is related to fact. Let's press on to, to verse 2. He says, In the pride of wickedness, and realize that these two things go together Gava, pride, and wicked activity. Learn this principle. When I operate in pride, that is, when I put myself first, let me say it another way, when you have an anti-Torah mentality. Why do I say anti-Torah mentality? Well, Paul teaches in the book of Galatians, all the Torah in one statement. What is that? You could probably say it with me. Via hafta arecha tamocha. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is the message, the primary message of the Torah. Love your neighbor as yourself. Pride is the exact opposite of that. So when I'm acting pridefully, when I'm acting against the Torah, what can I expect? I can expect to behave wickedly. 
And that wickedness is going to be directed at other individuals. Look carefully at verse 2. He says, In the pride of wickedness, he will persecute. He will pursue for the purpose of, of, of afflicting suffering upon who? Well, the next word is the Hebrew word ani with an ein. That means one who is poor, one who has been impoverished, one who is afflicted. And here's the, the message. Someone who is prideful, he is going to behave wickedly. And who is that wickedness going to be aimed at? Those who are vulnerable. This word ani speaks about those who lack, lack resources, lack ability, lack things. And therefore, because of what they lack, they are easily exploited. And it's pride that, that discerns there's that one. He's in need. He, he doesn't have much. And therefore, he's easy prey for me. That's what pride does. So realize, when I'm thinking of myself first, when I'm anti-Torah, what's going to happen? I'm going to act in wickedness, and that wickedness is going to be oppressive towards other individuals. Second part of verse 2, it says here, Ye tapsu. This is a word. It's the nifil. What is the nifal about? Well, the nifal speaks of the passive. So they will be seized. When you are prideful, when you are behaving wickedly, what's going to happen in the end? What's your future? It says here, such people, they are going to be seized by the plans that they have device their thoughts i am reminded of another scripture where it speaks about those who who lie awake in their beds and they're waiting for the next day they can hardly wait for tomorrow because they have these plans of 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 achieving achieving at the expenses of others how does a true man of God, a true woman of God, think in the night? They may lay upon their beds thinking, who can I bless tomorrow? Who am I going to encounter that I could help, that I could assist, that I could act in a way that is going to be a testimony that I belong to the living God? This God who loves, this God who is compassionate, this God who is indeed a help. That's what we should be staying up at night thinking about, but not these. These have plans, and these plans are going to seize them in the end and be the catalyst for their own demise. That's what the promise of verse 2 is telling us. Look now to verse 3. It talks about the wicked one who praises, who's excited, who's happy, who praises. The tavat nafsho. Now, tava is a word for want, desire. It's a word of passion. It's a word of, of lust. So this one, notice what it says here. This one who has the, the lust of his, his very being, this one is praising what? Wickedness. He's wicked and he's praising the wickedness which is all about achieving the lust of his flesh. Rather than praising God, who commands us to do that which is good, that which is holy, that which is righteous. Make no mistake about it. And, and we get a lot of negative emails with false accusations. That we are legalistic. We're not legalistic. We know it's by grace that one has been saved, but we believe in all the counsel of God's word and his commandments, although we are not under the punishment of the law. Now, hear what is being said. Many people don't understand when it says we're not under the law. What does that mean? That all the wisdom of the law, 
We, we just want to get rid of all the message, what God said. Just ignore that. That's no longer relevant today. That is exactly how Satan wants a person to think. And that's why when there's individuals that say that we need to unhitch the New Testament from the law, from the, the Old Testament, such a person is deceived. Such a person is pursuing pride. He wants to exalt himself and be popular rather than simply being a mouthpiece for the word of God. What the scripture tells us very clearly is this in the book of Galatians, that the commandments is like a tutor for an adolescent individual, a young person. And when that person grows up, he becomes responsible. That tutor is not going to punish him. That tutor's no longer over him, guiding him and such. But let me ask you a question. What the tutor taught, what the tutor instilled within that young individual, is it no longer relevant? Is it you get a certain age and just cast these things aside, they're no longer good? Obviously, that's not the case. It's now this one has graduated, he has matured where he knows, and he's responsible to live according to what the tutor taught him as a child and as an adolescent. So don't take the wisdom of the commandments of God and say there's no longer relevance. There is always relevance. Those who walk in the Spirit is going to be demonstrating the relevance, relevance and the righteousness of the law. So in a very, very real way, it is the one who is being instructed by the commandments that they're going to understand the expectations of God, the will of God, the behavior of God, because Messiah kept the commandments. And therefore, we, to, to have a proper testimony, we are going to be demonstrating the wisdom, the righteousness, the truth of the law. Not doing like these individuals who do what? They pursue the lust of their flesh and they hate the things of God. Look at the end of verse 3. They do something else. What's that? Well, the word berach here is the word for, for blessing. And what are they blessing? Well, the word here is the word for getting profit. And that's what some are all about. If you get a profit, that is, if you achieve what you want, then, then you're blessed. Not necessarily. There's a lot of people that achieve exactly what they want, and they're the most miserable of individuals. Think about how many people who are in Hollywood, who have great wealth, and what do they do? They end their life. He said, well, it wasn't intentional. Well, maybe it wasn't, but they were taking drugs and they took more drugs and more drugs and more drugs until it killed them. Why? They were trying to escape. They weren't finding satisfaction. See, when you're putting things into you, it's because you feel a lacking. You're trying to get something. But when you are one in spirit, meaning that you're living in the Spirit of God, following Him, listening to Him. You're not going to be wanting to, to receive. You're going to find the joy in giving. And that's why it says here, this one who's misguided, he is blessing prophet. And what does it say? He reviles God. He doesn't want anything to do with the things of God. What he sees as blessings is God's, uh, uh, what God says is not appropriate. Verse, verse 4. The wicked one in the heights of his anger. Now, that's exactly what it says. Rasha, this has to do with wickedness, the wicked individual. And it says, Ke gova. What is gova? Gova is height. 
And apo, the word af is, is in this case, is anger. So wickedness in the heights of anger. What does that teach us? A very important principle, and that is this. When I live in wickedness, what's wickedness? The, the violations of the commandments of God. That's how we know what wicked is. It's not based upon my standards, your standards, some standards of society. It's based upon the truth of Scripture, the laws of God. So when someone behaves wickedly, when someone is wicked, what are they? They are angry. And they are going to get more angry and more angry and more angry. That's why it says here the word of God is, is simple. It says the, the wickedness or the wicked one as the heights of his anger. What is he going to do? It says, bow yadrosh. What is that? Yadrosh means to, to seek something. He, he's not going to seek anger causes him not to seek that which is good, not to have an expectation of that which is right. Anger causes him to just destroy, to break through every standard, every barrier, every boundary that society has. He's going to do what is right in his own eyes. And this is why he says, keep going on. It's and Elohim ko me zimotav, which means in his plans, there is no God. So he's not going to seek God. He's not going to expect anything from God because his plans have, have taken into account there is no God. And this is becoming very, very attractive. Now, we're in Psalm 10. And in a month, we're going to be in Psalm 14. I just want to give you a little preview. We'll come back to this in four weeks. But when it says in Psalm 14, the fool has said, there is no God. And that's why there's instruction here. When, when someone says, I reject God, there is no God. I'm an atheist. I'm committed to that. That ends the conversation. Don't answer a fool in his folly. And what we see here, going back to our text, this individual, well, what it's saying here is, and this is godly counsel to us, God is telling this individual that seems to be abandoned, to seems that he's alone, that God has left him. He's saying, what's the, the alternative? The alternative is not to fear God, but to be selfish, prideful, to live in wickedness, to rebel against the standards of God. And in doing so, what does one do? He says there is no God in all of his plans. He doesn't consider God. Verse, verse 5. Now, when we get into verse 5, we have to be careful. Because there's two ways that you can understand it. You can understand parts of it referring to God or parts of it referring to this wicked one, prideful one, this angry one, who, who bursts forth through all barriers, all boundaries, all standards, because in his objectives, his purposes, he doesn't take God into consideration at all. But let's look at it. It says in verse 5, Yetchilu darko, or darkaf. Whether it's singular or plural, we'll come back to that. But many of the commentators see this as that he succeeds in all of his ways. Who's that? Well, some say that's God. But others see it as a warning. It is very, very dangerous to succeed when you are in opposition to the things of God. Because this success, this achievement, is going to cause you to be more prideful, more secure, and it's a false sense of security in your own ability, your ways. And that's why it says, look carefully at the text. It says, they that succeed in their ways all the time. What do we know about them? Well, they say this. Marom mishpatecha mi 
They, they are thinking that your judgment, meaning God's judgment, is, is beyond them and is not before. That it's out of the way, that it's been removed, and they won't experience it. And that's why it says here, kol tzorav yafiach behem. Which means this, and here again, some take this to be God, we'll do it both ways. I personally believe that it's speaking about this evil one, this one who says there is no God, and concerning all of his enemies, all those who are opponents of his. What does he do? Yafiach behem. What's yafiach? It's a kind of, and psh, psh, a discounting. It, he blows hot air at them saying, psh, that's nothing. They're, they're not able to, to withstand me. Why? Because this one succeeds in all of his ways. He thinks that because he has been full of achievements. achievements. Now, others will say, God is the one who, who succeeds always. And therefore, it's, it's your standards, oh God, that, that is going to be before them. Now, he thinks it's not. And it's God who kind of blows air at all of his enemies, saying they're not going to achieve something. So you need to do a very thorough study of verse 5. But for the sake of time, move to verse 6. Verse 6 is undeniably speaking about this, this one who is rebellious, this one who's rooted in pride and angry. For he says in his heart, I will not be moved. From generation to generation, he says, basically, there won't be any evil. Eve, I won't experience anything that, that I'm not set after, that I'm not trying to achieve. And then look at verse 7. Allah is an oaf in this case. And it says, his mouth is full of deceit and violence. And it begins with the word oath. That's what he's committed to. He's committed to, notice what it says here. His mouth is committed to deceit and violence. Why? To get what he wants. He's got to have it at all costs, meaning that if anyone stands in his way, he is going to destroy them. Under his tongue is trouble and a different word for wickedness or iniquity this is this one and what the scripture is trying to share with us is this we have two options and only two options that's usually how it is with god we can say there is no god and pursue and be driven by the desires of our evil inclination to be prideful angry people that are willing to destroy anyone that stands in our way and keep us from getting what we, we, we want. And we will grow prideful believing that, that we will achieve, that, that no one is a match for us. That's satanic. That's what Satan, we're studying the book of Isaiah also each week when we were in verse 14. That's the satanic mindset, that he is going to have victory over God, that God's ways are not going to win out. That is false. That one has been deceived by the father of lies because the father of lies has been deceived. So this one has taken an oath. His mouth is full of deceit and violence, and under his tongue is trouble and iniquity or wickedness. Verse 8. This one, in order to get what he wants, he sits in ambush in the courtyards now this word some translate as villages but it's it's not it's the word uh, uh it's the word for courtyards and what it's saying is that he is in public he sits in ambush but in a very visible way that's what it's trying to tell us his his deceit is so clever that it doesn't have to be concealed from, from sight. We read on. In the secret places, he kills the innocent. 
This is where Naki, the one who is clean or pure. He goes after, he wants the one who is, is right with God. He wants to destroy that one. He doesn't want anyone standing in opposition. Look now to the last part of verse 8. His eyes are, are looking towards the one who is, is uh, poor, the one who has been beat up, the one who is downcast. That's where his eyes are. He's seen once again how he can take advantage of those who are weak. Verse, verse 9. He sits in ambush in the secret places as a lion in the den. And he waits in ambush in order to, to snatch away, to capture once more the afflicted one, the impoverished one, the poor one. He will snatch the poor and he, with his drawing into his net. So he is cognitive in his wickedness. He's got a plan. Remember, his plan does not consider God whatsoever. And the one who is weak, the one who is impoverished, the one who is inflicted, the one who's the most vulnerable, this is who he's going to go after. He conceals his real intent, but he does so in plain sight. Verse 10, we read here, and he will crouch and he will bend and he will fall among his power. And who's this? Well, it's the one who is weak and impoverished and in a poor state. So this one who is prideful, this one who is full of anger, this one who is committed to his ways, what is he going to do? He is going to try to bow down, crouch, hide himself in order that with his power that he can cause to fall, who? Those who are the misfortunate ones, those who are the weak ones. And it simply goes to show that he is purposely, with intent, going after the ones who are the most vulnerable. And that is indeed the character of Satan, not the one that we put our faith in, the one who sees someone who is downcast, hurting, and what does he do? The man of God, the woman of God wants to lift them up. We want to be a blessing. So we see these two ways of behavior. Now let's go on to the next verse, verse 11. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. So this one, he's going to utilize his power to make those who are weak to be bowed down and crouched before him, those who are misfortunate. Because he has said, verse 11, in his heart, that God has forgotten, that he has hidden his face and that he will never be seen. That's what this one is thinking. God is, is not going to be visible. God is not going to act. God is no more that he's forgotten his standards. Now, one of the things that the scripture is showing is that this one is defiant and rebellious. Whenever God, and he thinks this is the case all the time, is not uh, immediately seen, Whenever there is injustice that is, is prospering, these wicked ones, these prideful ones, these angry ones, they admass to that location. And they do so because they think God's forgotten and they don't know who God is. God does not forget anything. Verse, verse 12. Now we go back to this one who is crying out the author of this song. And we are once more reminded of his thoughts. He says, verse 12, rise up, O Lord. God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the, the humble ones or the afflicted ones. It says, 
on account of why should the wicked revile God? And this is this word for revile, to abhor, or to think that, that God is no more. And notice the term Elohim is used that he reviles the judgment of God. And he's counting on that type of God is no more. And that's why today many people, and we see in this generation, more and more individuals, they identify themselves as atheists or simply, I, I don't believe in God. Not, not the God of the Bible. Why? Because they want to live unrighteously. They want to believe there's no God so they can pursue their objectives. Because uh, if there's no God, there is no godly objectives. Therefore, I'm in control. That's what this, this one is thinking. He says in his heart, Lo tidrosh. God will not uh, uh, sink an accounting. And it's simply a defiance here of a judgment day. And that's why this whole concept of judgment. And, and I think about these uh, uh, prosperity gospel people, also these individuals that are only good news, only encouragement and such. And I, I have a warning because there's one in particular and, and he wants to elevate the Gospels. And I'm speaking about the books of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He, he elevates them and that's fine, but he does so above that of rest of Scripture. That's not good. But, but here's the problem. He really doesn't elevate the Gospels. He distorts the account of Messiah. He, he distorts the teachings of Christ. Why? Well, if you read any of the Gospels, you will find that Messiah spoke quite, quite often about judgment, about punishment, and about hell. In fact, there's more about punishment in hell and condemnation in the Gospels than in the Old Testament. When you look proportionally at the amount of, of verses, by far the Gospels speak more about judgment and, and condemnation and hell. But these individuals, they never, they want to say, oh, we're gospel-minded, but they do not speak what the Gospels say. And that is because they want to distort the God of Scripture. Why? Because the God of Scripture is not popular today. So be it. That's okay. Because the teacher of the New Testament, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, does he not say in the Gospels that the way is narrow and difficult and few find it? Therefore, why should we have a distorted gospel, a wrong biblical presentation that fills stadiums when it's not? the truth of God. God's not going to be pleased with bringing people to a distorted gospel. No, these individuals, they, they choose only half or a quarter of what the gospel account really states about Messiah and his teaching. And that's what we see here. That they say, oh, God has forgotten. God will not require judgment and accounting. There is an accounting day. Now look at verse 14. You will see, this is what it literally God has seen, for you have, speaking about God, you have seen trouble and, and anger. And he says, you have looked and in your hand, you will give recompense. There will be an accounting and there will be a punishment. The word here, and it's a unique word in, in uh, uh, Hebrew, but it speaks about giving, and it's a word for giving a, a recompense in this, this context. Look again at our, our text, ready for the second part of verse 14. And unto you, the, the 
the afflicted one. Now, it's a different word. We've come in contact with it earlier in this, this passage. But it's one who's been impoverished. They will what? They will leave. The one who has been afflicted, they are going to depart from such thinking and turn to God. That's what it's saying unto you. The one who is the, the orphan, this orphan, it says, you have helped. Now, understand the, the correlation. The orphan departs from the world way of thinking. And unto you, God, they have gone. And unto you, they will find help. That's what it's saying. Verse 15. Break the arm of the wicked. Now, that is an idiom. Arm is synonymous with power. Arm is, is synonymous with deed. So break, destroy the power and the deeds of the wicked one. And also the, the evil, it says the evil one, let be sought his wickedness. Let be the outcome upon that wicked one, his wicked deeds. Let it visit him is what it's saying. Unto the extent that, that he will not be found that there will not be any future for him. He will not have an eternity of being known, but he will have an eternity of condemnation. Verse 16. Lord, the Lord, he is the king forever and ever. And the nations, and this speaks about those who have no covenant relationship, those who are of a no covenant connection with God, they will perish from his land. And here it means his creation. They won't benefit from the things that God has made. Verse 17. The desires of the humble ones you have heard. O Lord, prepare their hearts and your ear will hear. Now, this goes on to tell us something very important. When we began this, this one who was praying, he felt abandoned. He felt alone. He felt that God was so distant from him. He felt that, that God had disappeared. But notice, there's a change. He's speaking out in confidence and in faithfulness. He says, the, the desires of the humble ones you have heard, and the Lord you will prepare their hearts and your ear will listen in order to judge the orphan and also the one who is basically treaded down, beat up, those who have been oppressed. And then finally he says, last part of verse 18, there will no longer be again in the, the earth, the one who brings terror upon man. Now, it means upon humanity. When God does this, he has heard, he knows, and he is going to move. And when God does, he is going to remove from the earth, from his creation, the one who, who brings fear. And this really gives us an indication of the problem of the psalmist. He was fearful. And when we are fearful, what it's saying here is this, when we are fearful, it distorts our perspective, the right perspective that we should have. It's only with God, God's truth, that we'll see things properly. And God makes a promise, we'll close with this, that God... He is going to judge. He is going to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed. And there will no longer be that one, that one who oppresses, that one who brings fear upon humanity in the earth. That one is going to be no more. So it begins with a, a, a state of doubt, but it ends with assurance. As we remember God's nature, his character, his promises, we need to realize something. 
if we're having a bad experience, it's only a matter of time until God brings a change. And what is the implication of that? Persevere. Endure. Hold on to truth. Learn the truth of Scripture. Because that truth will give you a new perspective. And that new perspective will cast out fear. And when you pursue the things of God, you are going to be like it says here, the humble ones, not prideful. Pride leads to wickedness. Pride leads to anger. But humility leads to obedience. And humility will cause you to experience the joy. That joy of the Lord that passes all understanding. That peace and contentment that only God can give. You don't find it in the pursuit of the desires of your flesh. You find it when you pursue the things of God and truly desire his blessings rather than the counterfeit blessings that are scattered out and abound in this world. Well, until next week, may the real God bless you. The God who is through his son, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. It's in his name. And for his glory that we speak. Amen. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.